Hello everyone, it's Benny, and in this video, we're going to start working on shader resource management. And that's by far going to be the most difficult of all the resource management set things. Fortunately, after this, it's pretty much going to be over, but, you know, we still got to get through it. However, before I get into that, there's a few things I want to address. First off, a lot of people throughout the series have brought up, hey, your scene isn't realistic, you must have done the lighting wrong, your lighting's terrible, and... Guys, I, I appreciate that something's not right, because you're right, something isn't right, but it's not the lighting. The lighting is mathematics, and it's working just fine. The issue is the material. We're not telling it to light a very realistic material. Usually you don't see a perfect tile thing. So I switched the materials around, I've put bricks where the tile thing used to be, and tile where the bricks used to be. And you notice, just by that, it looks a lot better. Look at our look at our spotlight. It looks a lot more like you expect a spotlight to look. Granted, it's still not the ideal brick material, but hopefully you get the idea now. The idea is that, well, it's over with the material. And if you want to improve it even more, we could start playing around with specular powers and whatnot. You get a specular system that looks right for bricks. But, you know, I just thought I'd bring that up. Second thing that a lot of people keep bringing up all the time, and a whole bunch of different messages and comments and whatnot, is that my resource management isn't complete right now. And, well, I know that. That's why I'm calling this the resource management segment and not the resource management video. <laughs> I, I mean, come on, guys. I, I can't implement a perfect resource management thing in a single video. I do appreciate that you're letting me know. It's just, you know, I, I, I can't do everything in one video. I mean... I could if you want me to make a 50-hour video of the whole series or something, but I don't really want to do that. So, yeah, it's going to you know, take some time to get a perfect resource management system. Well, quote-unquote perfect. But yeah, I just want to address that before I get started. And now let's start with making some changes to our shader system. Now, shaders are going to be a little bit different than meshes and textures. Because we've got a little bit more going on here. We've got a full-on program to support, not just, well, some memory to support, you know? And we have uniforms, which are part of the program, which mean to identify an update. That's That can almost be a resource system of, in and of itself. We've got our current system, which is having everything that... all our different shader types in singletons. You know, like forward ambient, forward directional, and point and whatnot. And that's not ideal. That's not a good scaling system. So, we're gonna want to change that so everything can be contained within shader, but perhaps most significantly right now is, let's look at our forward point fragment shader, our forward spot fragment shader, and directional fragment shader, and look at this. Calclite function doing just about exactly the same thing for every single one of them. A whole bunch of different same old, same old structures and data types, and that's just terrible, terrible for code reuse. So that's the first thing we're going to deal with. We're going to fix our code reuse problem. And the way we're going to do this is with an include directive. So basically, here, in my load shader function, we're going to be supporting an include directive, which looks something like this, kind of like in C++ or C, where you see something like include file.h. That's an include directive. We're going to be supporting this in shaders, so just have a basic way of reusing code. We're not going to get into any full-on linking and cycle detection or, or you know, cyclical resource management detection, but yeah, all the advanced stuff. We're not going to do anything advanced with this. We just want to have something basic that lets us reuse code, at least in some way. We can move into the advanced stuff as we need it. So to start, I'm going to have a final string, I'm going to inc call include directive, and that's going to equal number include. This gives us a way to, well, just change the include directive if we want, just some way to specify it without having to write to hard code pound include. Not that I particularly think we're going to change it, but you know, it's there. And yeah, here's how we're going to change it though. Right here, we have this nice place where we're going through every single line of the shader source, and we're adding it to the shader file. I'm not going to always add the line to the shader file. I'm going to do a check. 
And that's if line dot starts with the include directive. If so, we're going to process the include directive. Otherwise, we're just going to add the line like normal. So how do we process the include directive? Well, what we want to do is identify this part of it, the file.h part, and include the full text of that file instead of this line, because we include this, this line as it is, we're just going to get an error, because that's not part of GLSO, officially. So, here's how we're going to do that. And it's going to be a little tricky, so I'm going to try and walk you through it. I'm going to do line.substring. And where we want to start is right here. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to start as my starting position. It's going to be include directive dot length. That puts it right here. And you notice there's only two more spaces to get to where I want. So it's going to be include directive dot length plus two. And now this does add some limitations. It means there must be exactly one space between the name and the include directive. I don't think, think that's a particularly big deal, but, you know, it's there. It's worth being aware of. A cool thing about doing it this way, though, is that there are sort of two ways to specify include directives in C++. One's with the quotes, the other's with angle brackets. And this way we can support both of them with the exact same piece of code. So that's kind of cool. And the end, well, we're going to want to end right here. So it's going to be line.length minus 1. That's going to place it right here, 1 before the end of the line. And now this adds another limitation. It means there can't be trailing white space at the end of it. But again, I don't think that's a particularly big deal. So great, that gets me the file name, the file name specified in the include directive. Well, yeah, with the limitations mentioned above, but this works for basic system. And I'm going to append it to the file. And you might be wondering, well, why are you appending it to the file? Aren't, aren't you supposed to load it? Yes, because this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass that in, the whole name, into load shader, and append whatever load shader returns, well, to the file. And that will be just a very easy way of supporting include directives. Again, it's not perfect. It has the limitations like before. It doesn't it also doesn't detect circular dependencies, so for example, if in file 1 I say include file 2, and in file 2 I say include file 1, you know, that's not going to work, but hey, hey, again, it works pretty well for a basic system. So let's start by changing point.fragmentshader, or point.fs. I want to reuse all of our lighting code. I want to move that to a header file. So I'm going to create a new document. I'm going to call it lighting, and to denote an OpenGL header file, I'm going to say GLH, or GLSL header file. You can make the file name extension whatever you want, I just like GLH. And I'm going to move all the structures and all the functions, like light, calc light and calc point light, into the header. Now right now this does depend on a few of the uniforms. So I'm going to have to be careful where I include it. I actually want to include it right here, lighting.glh. I'm going to change it in a moment so that it doesn't depend on the uniform, So that because I think it's kind of bad practice to force... Actually, wait, no, it wouldn't be, because of the way my system... Okay, never mind, maybe I'm not going to do that. But, but either way, point is, if our include directive is working right now, this should actually include the the text of lighting.h. So let's build. Shouldn't have trouble building this. And let's run. Let's see if I screwed something up horribly and point light stopped working. And, oh no, look at this. Point light is working. So great. And, now because I just realized, you know, we're going to need the same uniforms for lighting no matter what, I'm going to go ahead and include those inside the actual well, the actual file. And I'm going to put them at the top. You can refactor it so that it doesn't depend on having uniforms in the file later if you want, but I'm not overly worried about that. Actually, there is one thing. I don't want to include varying variables, because that's... well... Uniforms, I can, I can automatically detect and add uniforms in shader source eventually. I can't automatically detect and handle varying stuff eventually, so... 
Whenever I use world pass zero, like yeah, right here, gonna need to change. So <coughs> I'm gonna change calc point light my lighting dot h or lighting dot glh to take in a vec three of well world pass. And I'm gonna change world pass zero to that. Whoop. <laughs> there. And I can just pass that in to well the function. And there. And that means I should be able to include this at the top, like it probably should be included at, and hopefully not have any trouble. So build. Now granted, this does make our current shader system of having to manually detect and add uniforms a bit painful, but hey. Okay. Error world pass zero undeclared. Okay, clearly I've missed some place. And it was in calc light, so... I'm also going to take in a vec3 world pass. And I'm going to replace world pass 0 of that. And of course, where, whatever I call calc light now, I'll need to change that to, well, passing in world pass. There. So now if I go ahead and run, should, shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. There we go. Look at that. Point light working just fine. So I want to go ahead and do a similar thing for Spotlight and Direction Light. And I'm actually going to show a little bit of this on screen because, well... Oh, actually I have these comments here for later. Actually, this is kind of a fun thing. I want to show off in a moment, but I'm not going to show it off just yet. So, yeah. For now, I'm just going to paste these two commented lines of code between in the, cal in the calc light function between reflect direction and specular factor. So, yeah. Don't worry about that for now, but it's there. So, cool thing about this spot thing is I don't need to take in pa calc light or calc point light anymore because, well, they're already in lighting. Just need to add the spotlight structure to lighting.glh. Can get rid of spotlight, base light, attenuation, all that stuff. Can get rid of specular intensity power and IPOS because they're in lighting at GLH. And I can also move Spotlight over into the... into here. I am going to need to change this. need to take in a VEC3 world pass. And I'm going to move and say world passes... replace world pass 0 with that. I'm going to pass that into calc point light right here. And that should be good. So there. And yeah, I can get rid of this code. I can get rid of this. I can say just include lighting.glh. And at the end of here, I can put a comma and say world pass zero. And that should work for the forward spotlight. So let's run. And it crashes, because I forgot something. Okay, I've apparently missed something right here. I'll see if I can find it real quick. If not, I'll just do it off-screen. Okay, I've missed something. Yeah... One... Wait. Ah, right. I put it in the wrong place. That explains it. Right here. There we go. Never mind. I... Okay, well, and that should make it run. There! Spotlight, point light, reusing the exact same lighting code. All we've got left now is directional light. So, gonna go for directional.fs, going to copy the, or cut and paste the calc directional light function into here at the bottom blow everything else, and needs to take in some VEC3 world pass, which I'll just pass straight into the calc light function. And other than that, I can get rid of calc light, I can copy the directional light structure, I can, I'll put it above point light and spotlight, why not? And I can get rid of these t uniforms, I can get rid of the base light structure, 
get rid of this. Get rid of that line. That white space, because that's going to bother me. And I could just say, include light lighting.glh. And... Hmm. You know, honestly, you could, if you really wanted to, put the calc direction light, calc spotlight, and calc point light stuff inside the individual files. I'm just putting it here, because, well, it doesn't matter. The compiler is going to factor out unused code anyways. And these are really the major types of lighting things, but, you know, yeah. Just... Actually, no, this is good, because I'll need to reuse calc point light. Okay, never mind. Ignore me, I'm, I'm rambling. <laughs> There. So this should work for the direction light as well. Actually, well, no, it won't, because I forgot to pass in world pass zero into here, didn't I? Yes, I did. So pass in world pass zero, and now it should work. Excellent. Excellent. So now, I can show you something kind of cool. Right now, we're calculating all our lights with the Fong lighting model, right? Well, because we're reusing all our lighting code in the lighting.glh file now, we can easily change that. If I want to use the blend Fong modification, which, rather than calculating it with reflect direction, calculates it with normalize this and, well... Yeah, it calculates it slightly differently, as you can see here. It's, it's a way of approximating the Fong lighting model, which oddly enough ends up being more physically accurate in many cases, but, you know, it's just a weird quirk of it. And it's cheaper, so, yeah. But anyways, I can make that modification. I can just say, replace the two lines of code. Again, they look like this. I'm not going to talk too much about this, because I'm not really focused on lighting models right here. I just want to show off code for use. And yeah, so I change it to the blend Fong code, like this. And if I run, our specular highlights are going to be a little bit different. Yeah, see? Look at this. We've got blends fall highlights. See how they stretch out a whole lot more? Yeah. And that was just with one very simple code change. So yeah, you can choose whichever one you, you like better. They don't provide equivalent results with the same value, so that's something to keep in mind. You might have to change your values to change your lighting model. But yeah, just wanted to just wanted to point that out. And one final thing. I refactored all the function names to begin with a capital letter, because I personally prefer that convention, especially in C-like languages, where if you don't, it, the, it's almost like the function names can blend in with all the local variables, and it gets a little confusing, at least in my opinion. But that's really a matter of personal taste. You can you can leave it as is. I've when I've refactored in all the different files, and it works just fine. So, yeah. But with that, ladies and gentlemen, we have finished implementing a very basic include system. And yeah, it's not without its flaws, though. Right now in lighting.glh, we're specifying some uniforms here. And you might notice in our current system, this is not going to scale very well. You know, you're going to have to keep track of all the uniforms defined and all the different headers you can include, add them all manually, and it's just going to be a big, gigantic pain in the butt. Although I propose that having to add all your uniforms manually is already a gigantic pain in the butt. So why can't we just get the computer to do it for us? And that's going to be what we focus on in the next video. Adding uniforms automatically. And it's not going to be as straightforward as it might sound. But yeah, so that's going to be the next part of our shader resource management thing. Automatically detecting and adding uniforms. So thank you. Hope you enjoyed. Hope you learned. And I'll see you in the next video.